right, well, good. Well, then um, let's get started by doing our uh, opening prayers. So, um, Michael, will you do the honors tonight? Yes. Opening prayers. This is uh, just English, right? Okay. Altruistic motivation. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. <clears throat> All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. The Action Bodhicitta Prayer. <clears throat> Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. The Long Refuge Prayer. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yadams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. And we take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yadams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yadams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Taking the Bodhisattva vow. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind, and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path. I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I, too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. A short Refuge Prayer. <clears throat> In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, 
I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. The Four Immeasurables. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that helps us to set our intention, stating our motivation for why we engage in these teachings and practices and so on. And basically, we, we do this for the benefit of the enlightenment of other beings. We're developing selflessness. That everything that we do is for the benefit of the enlightenment of others. By doing that, we're helping ourselves. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, anything you want to talk about regarding uh, shamatha meditation, calm abiding meditation that we were speaking about last week? Okay. Well, you know, it, it is um, important to be reading the text and it is important to try and develop you know your own experience with these things so if during the course of your week if you find that you can spare you know 20 minutes or a half an hour or something and you can review this and and be able to uh, begin to do a practice on your own uh makes a huge difference and that's where you know the um that's where the benefits come when you develop your own practice. So uh, calm abiding shamatha meditation is uh, at the core of that. So we continue to talk about this tonight, but it's something that we're always coming back to. And the shamatha meditation is just one part, and then there's parts that come after it, and there's a few things that come before it. So when we study um, the stages of meditation, which is the companion book to learning Buddhism, will explore those um, different stages in greater depth and so on. But, but it all centers around uh, shamatha, calm abiding meditation. So last week, we ended by doing a, a short meditation and we were practicing the, the seven posture of Varanchana, as it's called. Varanchana is um, a meditation Buddha. And um, so we're, we're sitting in the seven points. So to review, the seven points are that first our legs are crossed if we're sitting on the floor in a cushion. We're sitting in a chair. Uh, our legs are together. Our knees are together and our feet are together in a, in a comfortable position. We don't have to be rigid. If we need to separate our legs a little bit, that's fine. But they should be straight. Should be, you know, a noble, elegant position. One that you can hold for a time without any uh, uncomfortableness and that you should find the sit bones and put your weight 
on your sit bones on the cushion or on the chair and so that you're not pressing against the flesh of your thighs or your butt which might cause you to uh, have your legs kind of feel like getting numb falling asleep or anything like that so you want to maintain a good blood flow while you're doing this so finding those sit bones is a important part of this so we're sitting in that position and then the most important part of the whole thing, whether we're sitting on a cushion or in a chair, is keeping our back straight. And the reason for that is, as I explained, that it is an energy channel. <clears throat> and our, our life force, the energy that we have from the moment that we are conceived all the way through our entire life until we pass and we, we, ex we eject that life force, but that life force runs up and down through the center channel parallel to our spine but it's inside our body so we don't want to cramp it up we want it to be fully capable of, of moving up and down unimpeded and then along that center channel are the different chakras and the chakras are our connection points that then go off and and there's channels that go off in different parts of our body um, through from that life force going up and down. So we're not going to spend any time talking about the chakras tonight or the channels, but uh, just to know that it's important to keep our center channel clear for that reason. And then we, our hands uh, can be preferably, you know, they're at our navel, four inches below our navel with our left hand up and our right hand lying in our left hand and our thumbs touching is the classic meditation position, four inches below our navel. And if we pull our shoulders back in a proud position so that we have a, an elegant position, not our shoulders up or, or too relaxed, but they're back, it, it pulls our hands right into our abdomen. If we prefer to have our hands palm down, touching our, holding on to our knees is perfectly fine. And you can alternate between positions if you like during the time that you're doing your meditation, you know, just to keep yourself feeling fresh and so on. But, um, but either these two position, positions are the most preferable, but if you have other positions that you prefer at this time, whatever, makes you comfortable is fine. Then our neck and our face, our head is forward just a little bit, just a little bit. It's and our chin is down just a little bit. And the, the visualization is like a, a noble horse, like a steed, a noble steed, either a mare or a stallion. And the horse has a long face and so on. And his eyes are, are kind of looking down a little bit and nose is looking down so this is just the the visual of of how your face is of how your head and your neck is so you're in that position and then your eyes can be open or closed ultimately we want to be able to keep our eyes open and there's uh, you know but in the beginning it's just a gaze you know where maybe your your eyes are just the eyelids are almost closed, but just relaxed. And you're just looking down in the direction of your nose, but past your nose, out to maybe four or five feet in front of you. So you're not looking at anything special. You're, not, you're just relaxed and, and engaged. You're not staring. And, uh, but if you can close your eyes, is good in the beginning so that there's less distractions because if our eyes are open in the beginning, we might tend to uh, fixate or begin to question things that we're looking at and so on. So keeping our eyes closed can be useful too. But if you prefer, if you close your eyes, you open your eyes, the, 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 the meaning is to, is to not be looking at anything in particular at this time. And then the next thing is that our tongue is at the top of our mouth, is at the roof of our mouth behind our front teeth. And this keeps our, our mouth moist. It keeps the saliva working in our mouth. So 
If we are breathing through our mouth, our mouth won't dry out in this way. When we breathe, typically we're trying to breathe through both nostrils simultaneously at this time. So we're breathing in and we're filling our lungs with fresh, clean, pure air. And we're filling our lungs by opening up the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the muscle that is pushing up and down at the bottom of the lungs. So when the uh, diaphragm is expanded, it means it's pulling down the lungs, which is pulling in fresh air. So when that happens, our abdomen naturally extends. So our belly is kind of going out. We're not be breathing from the chest. We're breathing from the belly. So we're breathing in by expanding our abdomen, which pulls down the diaphragm, which opens up the lungs and sucks the fresh air coming in. And then we hold that breath. And then we exhale by contracting the belly, which pushes against the diaphragm, which pushes against the lungs and forces the stale negative dark air out. And then we hold that vacant breath, that empty breath. And then we repeat that over and over again, that breath, watching, we call that watching the breath. And this is the most fundamental of all the uh, 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 meditation practices that we can do. And as a matter of fact, this is the very practice that the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, 2,600 years ago, used to, to practice his meditation while he was sitting underneath the enlightenment tree and when he attained enlightenment, this breathing exercise. So whenever our mind wanders during the time that we're, we're doing our meditation, which it's very likely to do, we bring it back, we, we catch ourselves, you know, our mind wandering, we say, okay, you know, I don't need to think about that now. I make a note if I need to, something I need to remember or whatever, but I let that thought go and I bring it back to watching the breath in this particular case. So the breath becomes the object of our meditation in this case. So we say that we are, uh, we can, meditate with an object and without an object. So obviously without an object is a more advanced practice. So as beginners, we need to have an object. And the support is that it's something that we're doing with our body and our, our, our mind, our intellect. We're, we're, we're thinking about what we're doing uh, as our body does it and so on. So this breathing you see is connecting our physical body with our intellectual mind, the way it's breathing in and breathing out the, the visualization of the, the clear breath coming in and, and the uh, uh, dark um, breath going out and so on, that it's virtue coming in and it's non-virtue going out. So this is a mental process. So. This is how we're tying things together, meditating with an object like this, with characteristics, with an object, with a support. Um, so what we are developing is one-pointed mindfulness. One-pointed mindfulness. We have a monkey mind at this point. Our mind is constantly jumping from one thing to another. If I said, okay, we're going to do a meditation now. And I just want you to sit in whatever position is comfortable for you. And I want you to think of nothing. You can probably do it for about five seconds before you start thinking about the position you're sitting in or that you got it's snowing outside or that you got to do 20 things or whatever. It's very difficult and it's very natural for our mind to be jumping around like that because this is what our brain does. It thinks, it's always thinking. So what we're trying to do is we're learning how to control that now. You know, after all these years of getting away with having a monkey mind, now we're trying to harness that. 
you know, and think of it in terms of energy. You know, we, we are trying to harness our energy. We, our physical body is in this very neutral position. It doesn't need very much energy to maintain its stability. And we're trying to focus the intellect on our one-pointed mindfulness breathing or what our object of the meditation is. And so those two energies, the physical and the intellectual energy come together and then it kind of unlocks the spiritual energy of our heart center. So this is the goal. This is what we're trying to do. So, um, so, so the one-pointed mindfulness is a key element in our attention, what we're trying to do. We don't have to think, you know, all the time, well, I got to think one-pointed, I got to think one-pointed. You just think of the object that we're talking about. In this case, it would be the breathing. If on the other hand, you have another object that you would rather use, let's say it is a, uh, a visual object. Maybe it's a picture. Maybe it's, uh, you know, something that is, um, uh, speaks peace to you in one way or another. It shouldn't be something like a candle. It shouldn't be something bright because that will, you know, if you're looking at it, you're gazing at it and so on, it, it can hurt your eye after a period of time. So you want it to be soft. You want it to be uh, quiet. Uh, it could be some music, but it should be something very, very subtle, very serene music, not complex music. It shouldn't be very loud. You know, maybe you could play you know, prayers in the background or something like that. And the object of this attention is that when your mind wanders, as it does, that you bring it back to this object, to this photograph, to this image, to this sound that you are hearing. So you're bringing it back to something like that. Maybe it can be a flower is a, or is a good example. So the um, something that we see, something that we hear are the two best kinds of, of, of focuses because if you have something that you smell, like say you're burning incense, then you know, it, the, the incense comes and goes, you know, it, the, it, it runs out of, out of uh, burning material and then you lost your, your point of focus, you know, so you can't do that. And of course you, you don't wanna put a candy in your mouth to, to, for your taste or something like that. And your touch, you don't want that to be disturbed. You know, that's too much activity. So through your sight or through your hearing are, are the two best things for an external object. The internal object, you can use an internal support and that would be the breathing. Okay. Mm. So no matter what the object is, whether it's the breathing or it's a flower, a picture, or it's some music that we're hearing or something like that, we shouldn't be analyzing it. It shouldn't be something to analyze. We're not trying to pick it apart. We're not trying to put it back together again. It should be just a, 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 a touchstone, so to speak, to bring us back to one point of mindfulness. You know, the breath is very powerful. You know, that's, uh, I think, the favorite thing to do. It's something you always have with you. You don't have to worry about having a special object. And it is something that is internal, you know, so, and it does have a, a, uh, a connection point with everything else. You know, the object, if it's, if it's a sight object, like a flower or something, um, you know, it's just bringing the mind together. But after that, you know, it's it's hard to make any other connection. You know, oh, I'm looking at the flower. Oh, I'm looking at the flower. But by watching the breath, it has uh, a little bit more connection point to it. So I do suggest that. Mm. Yeah, Lance. <clears throat> Yeah, um, we like we like to say that the uh, 
the, the breath is is very powerful because we we carry it with us for our entire life but it also lives in the body and the one nice thing about the body is that it's always in the present so when we find ourselves time traveling uh we can go back to the breath and we're automatically in the present moment that's correct so one thing that i think is important is to give yourself a time frame in which you are going to engage in the practice what what was doing what well uh rebecca had a question doing what expand that question please time traveling oh my yes yeah uh, yeah really quickly um one of the one of the terrible things about humans and the way that they they uh meditate or don't or pay attention or don't <clears throat> is that they spend not nearly enough time in the present moment ah. uh, so what, we're, what we are they say we we travel in time so we're always so we're moving past from the, past the past present. future yeah mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. got it thank you so one of the things that we can fall into a trap with meditating is have I meditated long enough, you know? And um, what was I doing before and what am I going to do in the future and so on? So to give yourself a, a reasonable time frame is really good. So in the beginning, we should have short little meditations, five minutes. It's better to do five minutes of a of a productive meditation than trying to do 20 minutes of something that's unproductive. But if you're doing a five minute meditation, you meditate for five minutes, you take a short break of maybe 30 seconds or a minute, and then you go and do another five minutes. Then you take another short break and then you do another five minutes. So in other words, you do your 20 minutes or 15 minutes or half an hour, whatever, through these short little five minute periods. As you do that and become more and more stable, more comfortable in that, more confident in that, you can see that you can increase that five minutes to seven or eight minutes or to 10 minutes and so on like that. But if we try and do 20 minutes or 30 minutes right off the bat, it's, it's not an obtainable goal for most people. It presents more of a problem than a solution. So one of the things we start thinking about is, am I doing it long enough? Where, where is the five minutes? So the thing that I recommend, the thing that I've found that is most useful, that technology really helps us with, is if you have a smartphone, it's got a timer built into the smartphone in the clock function. And if you can use that, and there is a wonderful uh, app, it only costs a dollar for this app. And it has all these different meditation bells and bowls as signals to, um, to tell us time's up. Can you hear these? Because I got a call coming in, so it overrides it. So you can set all these different things. So uh, this is designed for meditation, which is really wonderful. Uh, but there, I'm sure there is a clock that is one of the um, basic apps that's in your phone, no matter what kind of phone you have. And it's going to have some kind of a timer function in there. So if you can set a timer function for five minutes or 10 minutes or, a, you know, different intervals, and then be able to select that very easily. And then after the five minutes, it just makes a gentle reminder, a tone, a bell or something to say, okay, the five minutes is up. Now you don't have to be thinking about, am I spending enough time? is time up. You can relax and just enjoy the meditation. 
There could be other things, you know, if you're listening to a piece of music, it could be when the when the music track is up, you know, you know, well, this is a four minute, pardon me, or a five minute track. When that's up, that's when I stop, something like that, you know. But the problem with that is it gets repetitious and, and gets predictable. And then you start paying attention to, you know, the rhythm of, of the track and, you know, the intervals and, oh, here's the chorus part. You start picking the, the music apart and so on like that. So doing something that is quiet, but having this, this kind of a timer reminder is very, very good. Um, there could be other techniques like using your mallow beads, using your beads. But then what that, if you do that, it's fine. But then, um, but then it, 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 it forces you to be doing another physical activity. So it robs you of some of that energy that we're trying to harness together with the mental energy to be able to open up the heart. But you can try it, you know, if it's convenient, try it, experiment with it and so on and see how it works for you. I mean, all this stuff is fine to, to experiment with and that's what we should do to test all this. Don't take my word for it or anybody else's word for it. Develop your own system and your system should be open-ended, which means that you can make changes. If you find, oh, I don't like this part of the system anymore, I want to go to another system, it's fine. Let yourself do that. No boundaries, no limitations. So, another thing about meditation is that we can get very rigid about it. And on the other side of that is, we can get too loose with it. So different people have different proclivities for rigidity and for looseness. So we're not gonna go into any detail about that, but you'll, you'll know who you are, you know how it works. And, and it can vary from day to day, from session to session, whether you're feeling rigid or you're feeling loose. Sometimes that rigidity can come from tension, some kind of anxiety. Sometimes the looseness can come from just being tired and sleepy. So being able to read that for yourself and being able to not let that totally interrupt the session for you, but to be able to work with it. If you're too loose, if you're too sleepy, then open your eyes, open your eyes up wide and you look up and you look at something, you know, up on the wall, high up on the wall. And that becomes your focal point. That becomes your, your characteristic, your, your, um, um, your object. You know, and by doing that, you know, it's you're you're activating more of your eyesight and so on. Um, rather than being sleepy and having your eyes closed and so on like that. If you're too active and you're too rigid, you're too agitated and so on, then watching your breath is very, very good for that because it's very calming, it's very restful, and so on like that. And so by doing, by concentrating on that can be very, very functional. So looseness, you don't want to be too loose. You don't want to be too tight, you know, and you don't want to abandon the practice, work with the practice. Our, our ego is going to say to you, why are you doing this? Why are you sitting here? You could be, watching football. You could be petting the dog. You could be reading a book. There's so many things that we could be doing. Why aren't you doing these things? Why are you sitting here doing this? And this is the activity of the ego because the, acti because the ego is the one who loses here. We are giving the ego, a 
space. And the ego wants identity. It wants body. It wants position. It wants power. And by doing these things, it's taking power away from the ego. So the ego is going to fight you a little bit, you know? So we have to be able to persevere. And we have to not, you know, be so uh, rigid with the ego. We have to have compassion for the ego, you know? But we have to be able to be aware of the ego and let them down gently. So, um, so by focusing on this and this again, you know, by doing this in short bursts and five minute little sessions really helps us to do that. You know, the ego will catch up with us quickly enough, you know, saying, oh, is, is, why isn't the bell going off? Why isn't the timer going off? You know, it should be going off now. I, I want to think about something. So this is all ego. So you're going to see how the ego works in a very dramatic way, you know, in its, in its subtlety. We, we don't, you know, in our everyday ordinary mind, we don't pay attention to that. We don't think of it. We don't call it ego. But that's what our, it's the I, me, mind. What am I going to do now? What's happening to me? What do I need to do? I, me, mind. Where is my stuff? You know, so we're going to see how the ego starts interfering with our peace, our peace of mind. Because what we're trying to go for is peace of mind. And it's within us. It is our natural state to be peaceful. It's our natural state to be happy and serene. But through our society, we have been conditioned to think, Oh, I got to keep going. I can't sit there. I can't do this. You know, I got to stay up till 1130. I got to keep doing. I'm not ready for sleep. I, I got to do more. I got to do more. I got to get up early. I got to do more. Instead of being able to have peace of mind and relax. And as we say, don't forget to smell the roses. So we have to develop this system. This is a system. So we're, we're learning these, these parts and it's up to every one of ourselves to, to be able to put this system together in a way that, that works for us, that we can remember, that is repeatable for us and just flows very naturally. So what might work for one of us may not work for another one of us. But generally, the system works for everybody. So it's just a matter of finding your key elements of the system. And again, keep it open-ended because things change. Don't allow yourself to be rigid. Mm. So as we are meditating, as we're sitting in this position, thoughts are going to come up. There's going to be mundane thoughts like, oh, I got to put gas in the car. Oh, I got to pay the mortgage. You know, what day is today? I got to do that. And there's going to be, oh, I got to get dinner ready. There's going to be all kinds of mundane thoughts are going to come up that should be relatively easy for us to be able to compartmentalize and say, I don't need to worry about that now, you know, get over that. But then there may be thoughts that come up that have to do with our meditation, that have to do with the Buddhism that we've been learning, that have to do with our spirituality. There have to be things that deal with psychology or, or something like that, something a little deeper that you would like to think about, you know, but you've never had the time to do. You were always suppressing, pushing away. So thoughts can come up and maybe those thoughts need attention. And maybe that becomes the object of your meditation. 
And maybe then you get your piece of paper out, your pencil, and you begin to write down some notes. Maybe it's a one word remembrance, or maybe it's a phrase, or maybe it's an illustration. Maybe you like to draw and you remember things better by an illustration. And that becomes the focal point of your meditation. And that's perfectly fine and is very healthy because all this wisdom is all within us, you see. And it speaks to us in sometimes, you know, layered ways. It speaks to us in symbology and so on. So we need to be able to have a way to express that to ourselves, to allow that to come out. So don't feel that because we're doing this meditation that I, I, I can't enter into that kind of an examination. The goal would be to allow that thought to come up, write it down, draw a little drawing, and then go back into your meditation. If you can do that, go back into your one-pointed mindfulness. But if it is the kind of thought that you're really enjoying and you know it has to do with your meditation, with this practice, then follow it. Then, then explore that to the point of where you feel there is an exhaustion, where you've looked at it from different points of view, and now you can let it rest, and now you can get back to the meditation. So usually this happens in a little bit of a more intermediate meditative exp uh, uh, experience. It may not happen right away. You're going to be first dealing with the time element and the breathing element and so on like that. But I make the point about this so that if it does happen, enjoy that and, and know that it's not something that is, that is non-virtuous. Or, or negative. One of the things that we're trying to, to do is to really see what is virtue and what is non-virtue. So by these thoughts coming up, sometimes we'll be indicators of what that is. And those things that we thought were virtuous, we may find out were were non-virtuous. Maybe they, they had a subtlety to them. Maybe they were leading to something like jealousy or leading to greed, although we didn't recognize it that way. But we saw it as part of our power. And our power is one of the things that we're trying to give up. Because if we're holding on to that, we're grasping at that, we're becoming selfish with that, who benefits with that? the ego. Mm. Just looking at my notes here. Does anybody have any questions that you want to speak about right now? Yes. Yes. Hi, Zara. Hey, I'm, I'm driving right now. I apologize. I'm not in front of my normal laptop, but um, did I... well, don't, don't meditate now, please. I'm not going to, don't worry. Um, but I'm on audio only, so I can't see all of your amazing faces right now. Um, I wanted to uh, wanted to make sure I heard you correctly in relation to what you just were uh, summarizing. So if I'm stuck with a thought that's really, um, we'll just say emotionally overwhelming, like I go through a, like a negative interaction with someone, like a work experience or like I'm fighting with a family, and then I keep like it's consuming me internally in my mind. Are you you're suggesting just let it be, like just let it happen, let the turmoil inside 
go and, and don't fight it. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying that we need to be able to uh, deal with it. So okay. the question becomes, do we deal with it in our meditation? Or do we have to deal with it in a contemplation and more of an analytical time that's outside of our meditation? So by writing down what you think that emotion is or something that, that, uh, that signifies what that emotional thought that you're having is, and then you deal with it a little bit later, may be the thing to do. But on the other hand, if it's so powerful that you can't do that, you've got to deal with it now, then you have to apply the things that we've been learning before we got to this point. When we talked about the five poisons, we talked about the causes of the five poisons, we talked about the antidote of the five poisons, and the five poisons make up the 84,000 emotions. So the, the, the emotion that is disturbing you is bound to be some combination of those five poisons. So then by uh, examining that, taking the time now to examine that, that may be the thing to do. And you're saying examining it intellectually, like just saying, okay, this is, I'm going through this, and this is what I'm feeling versus bringing it forth into meditation where it's yeah. not, okay. not, not, not suppressing it any more than it's already been suppressed. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Of, okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, so um, in, in an experience I had this weekend where I do, I do service time for a professional organization, obviously it's gifted service time, I'm unpaid, I'm a volunteer, and I had a negative interaction in an email exchange with another professional, and it, I, I caught myself going through this highly emotional response uh, because I was upset and angry at this other person for being so rude in their email because I'm a volunteer and this is all like free time I'm giving hours of my life for this, you know, chapter for like a good cause. And this person was so rude to me and just, uh, so I, I really attached a lot of emotion and felt very, like my ego was there in this experience. And I, I kept Lance, I kept telling myself, like, Zara, like, stop, like, let this go. This is your ego responding to an email of words that mean really nothing. But I, it was so hard, Lance. And I tried to go into meditation. Um, I, I like it was incredibly difficult. It was a very emotional um, evening. Like it was hours of like waking up and thinking about it. And I, I kept trying to pull in to some of these strategies. And I, I, I was unsuccessful this weekend, Lance. <laughs> were you home or were you were you out and about? What were the circumstances there? Yeah, I, I got I got I was out and about when it came up on my my cell phone. It popped up, and then so it just it became a distracting event when I was with my family. So it had this also domino effect about being present in my what was actually happening in my life in front of me, um, and and I was fighting that. I was very angry about not being able to stop the reaction so that I could attend to my nephew who's six years old, right? Being present with him. Um, it, 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 I struggled and I like, I was angry at myself. Like I was like, do better. You can be better than this. And I was fighting it and it just spiraled and I was struggling to like go well, to a place. When you got, how was it when you got home? You it was better. It yeah, it was better. Yeah, it was and better. How, and I, go ahead. How did it get better? Um, well, there was less distraction. Well, I was able to go and hide in a room, right? Where no one else could see my face, where I didn't have to put up energy to put on like a happy smile, right? Where I could just be calm and still and hide in like a bedroom where I could sit down. And, but then I kept wanting to read the email over the words were like triggering. And then I, I kept saying it, like, there was like an internal argument, like, these are just words and they really don't mean anything unless you allow them to mean something there. They're, it, it was incredible. I had like an intellectual debate with myself inside my head. Um, and then it was very, like, I was like crying. I felt like my soul was crying. Um, Lance, like it was like, please let go. Like Zara, like use this opportunity to detach from what you're experiencing. It was a really hard evening for me. And I woke up at six o'clock in the morning. It was consuming me why I couldn't let this go and practice this opportunity that the universe was allowing me to experience. It, 
it was hard. Um, it was well, a hard 24 I, I, hours. So the short answer is you were doing the best you could with what you had. Yes. <laughs> you know, I think it was, that part is clear, you know. Uh, however, as we get more um, uh, proficient, more adept at being able to bring those kinds of um, uh, emotions onto the path, we say, you know, through uh, different technique and, and so on, we become, we're able to deal with those things, you know, in real time much better, but sometimes that, that needs to be compartmentalized and you know you're out with family you're doing things and everything so you really can't spend the time to to focus on that eventually it'll become more and more automatic for you to be able to do that to be able to recognize that the bottom line what i'm trying to get to is is that when we develop the practices of meditation and part of that includes these different practices that we do, these different prayers that we use, these different techniques that we include in these uh, meditations to help us to um, transcend the emotions, to be able to see our ego, and to be able to recognize that the things that are bothering us are temporary things, just like you were dealing with. And it gets, it gets us to the ability where we're able to say, you know what, I'm gonna stop fooling around with this. I'm gonna stop thinking about this. I'm only hurting myself. It's not changing anything. I'm just gonna stop. And it really becomes that simple. But it takes practice to be able to do that. Lance, I, I may be barking up the wrong tree here, but I'm, I'm going back to the prayer of the, the four immeasurables Yes. Michael Red. Yes. But it talks about being liberated from suffering. Yes. And 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 never being separate separated from happiness that is free from sorrow and, and so on. Yes. What she has been describing um, in, in, in she's suffering. She's a, correct. Balls, you know. So, but suffering at times is a a gateway to growth, is it not? I mean. I mean, well, yes, of course, of but course, necessary but, we, but, but, but we also have to know how to liberate it and not follow it down, as we say, into the rabbit hole of unhappiness, suffering and depression and so on. So there comes a point where we have to cut it off. All right. Where we, we have to intellectually analyze it. Right recognize it for what it is and say, okay, now it's time for me to stop. And that's a process to do that. But being liberated entirely from suffering to me suggests a world where there is no suffering. And if there is no suffering, I don't see the potential for growth. I don't. In this world, we have suffering all the time. Right. It doesn't mean that we're suffering all the time, but the potential is there for us all the time. We're very fortunate where we live and the kind of people we are. We don't suffer near as much as most other human beings on this planet suffer. Every moment they're suffering. They don't know whether they're going to live the rest of the day. Their life is at risk. People that got COVID, people that live in war zones, people that are hungry because they they have famine and, and pestilence and so on. So we're we're very fortunate. You know, yeah. but people are suffering in different ways and so on. So we can't be so jaded to think that uh, that um, that we're like that. Or not, or or not like that. That we don't have suffering. We have to be able to see what our suffering is. Our suffering is much more intellectual, much more emotional. I was, Go I was, ahead, was that. that suffering, it seems to me, does have a purpose. Well, it shows us how much more work we have to do. Right. 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 Yes. If that's. Okay. If, that's, if that's your basic point, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. 
Zara? Um, I, no, I, that actually is really helpful and insightful. And as a closing comment, just to the narrative I shared, I think the growth I experienced in that moment was I recognized what was happening. And, and I've never had that point where I was able to go to an intellectual space, if that makes sense. I was able to say, you like self detect, you are unraveling, and these are the side effects. That's um, right. That's right. Yeah. So, the next, so the next question becomes how do I get to that point quicker? And how do I? protect myself from getting to that point of being upset? Well, and I think you're right. We're, we're, all, we're all very lucky. Like you just described, there's a lot of beings that are suffering in other ways. Um, like you said, day to day that all of us are privileged on this call to not have that level of suffering. And a lot of the things I've noticed, it's just all language based stuff that gets caught up where overthinking things people say because that's those are the types of things I'm suffering from those are the challenges like I'm not suffering for food or shelter uh, but in those complex relationships I have with other people and the conversational exchanges like you said that evoke emotion yeah. to overcome of those responses so it's probably I would say one of the most difficult things because as humans that that's distinctly different the fact that we can have conversations it delineates us so much from animals like you talk about all the beings on the earth and that is such a distinct feature of us as sentient beings like our, our conversational ability and like the use of language um, and the impact it has to cause suffering right like the use of language it's really fascinating yeah and, and um, one of the things if i can just interject here one of the things that, you know, I, I think, and I've been a victim of this, my own, my own victim of this many times, is that through texting and emails and this, you know, detached conversation that you have with people, it's very easily misconstrued. That when you can see and have a conversation with somebody, see their body language and their facial expressions, and you can have an immediate dialogue to be able to say, well, what do you mean by that? Or they can see you reacting to what they just said and they say, oh, I didn't mean to upset you. You know, so the intentions get lost in texting and, and emails and so on, that human touch. And, and, the, and the great terrible thing about this is there's a whole generation of people who don't realize that. You know, we grew up in a time where we didn't have that. And now we're missing it through texting and emails and saying, you know, it's so convenient, but at the same time, we wind up having these emotional responses to these very short messages. But there's kids that that's all they know. And what's, what's the danger there? You know, I, I, you know, I don't live with a kid like that, but you guys do. You know, what is that like? I would say that they have a more nuanced experience of those tools than we do. How do they do that? Is that the emoticons? I, it's just, that is the, so this evening, my son got on his cell phone and talked on it to someone. And I, he never does that, right? He's on his computer chatting. He's got his headset. They're playing a game and they're chatting or they're texting one another or they're, um, he never just makes a phone call and talks on a phone. And my husband was really excited. About, oh, look, he's talking on the phone. Like he's got a friend and uh, he's with other people all the time. It's just that the tools that he uses are not the tools that are familiar to you. And I really do think that they have, a, when they send one another text messages, they understand what they mean the same way that we understood it talking on the phone. And, you know, my grandmother understood writing letters. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but I don't, I, <laughs> it's hard for me to understand that. You know, I, I can't, I haven't experienced that like that. And I, I don't, I don't think that we can. The track that Zara is going to many more times. Oh, well, and I think that's largely because our brains 
formed at a time when we were using particular tools and that's how we're wired to work. But, you know, it took me a long time to get the hang of my cell phone and that'll date me. And my son at like five could pick up and say, oh, mom, let me just show you how to fix this in your setting. Like, where does he get that? Right. Well, that's the paradigm what? shift that happens in general. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it was a good conversation, Zara, and I hope it, it shed some light on your situation. I think what, you know, you were being your own doctor there. Yeah, it's, it's helpful for me because um, kind of going alluding to what she's just describing a lot of but yeah, it was an email. So you, going back to your point, Lance, you, you are correct, I would say, um, and I'm, I'm 40. So I didn't get a cell phone until I was 23. But I'm very much used to uh, connecting through looking at people's faces and body language, as you just described. And, and, and so a lot of the work in business I do shifts now to technology in a way such that I can't get those context clues um, to immediately to make those. But but then the opportunity now arises where they create experiences for me to work on like what happened this weekend, right? Where I realized the work I need to do because I had such an emotional reaction. It really uh, jolted me that I realized you need to work on this. This is an opportunity for growth. Well, I've had it too many times. And, and usually it's with the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter yes. you know my daughter you know her friends you know things like that yeah exactly because we're not communicating it the same way i totally agree with you yep yeah yeah um bavani did you have something that you wanted to add to the conversation sometimes i think it helps when a situation like that happens is to try to see where that person is coming from and to see that perhaps they're coming from a place of suffering and to have compassion for them. And that helps to ease our misery of interpreting what they said or what we're feeling from what they said. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, but you know, going back. Well, but when you can see that person and understand that person, that's an easier process, I think, than doing it, you know, so uh, remotely through texting and so on. Oh, absolutely. But that's what we have to work with today. So we have no, to do it. No, no. Bavani, I actually, um, I, I, so Lance, I incorporated that. I actually thought about the person's email and I actually was like, send compassion. I literally intentionally said, send love and compassion to him because maybe he's, coming from a place of like maybe he's not sleeping at night maybe there's a reason why this email seems so aggressive and antagonistic right like there's something else wrong in his life that this is really representing something else and i i pray and hope that that gets resolved i i, I went there and i was able to go there very briefly but my emotion overtook yeah. that process but i appreciate you pointing that out because i think that needs to be part of my process and overcoming is shifting my focus yeah. to wow this person yeah I, and I, I appreciate you pointing that out because I, I remember like I had Bavani I had like 30 seconds dedicated to him out of 24 hours where I thought maybe something's wrong in his life <laughs> and then I, and then I shifted back to myself and how I felt about it versus what he made me that 30 seconds has, has turned into two days for you no kidding <laughs> <laughs> you know, and 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 this goes to a point this is an interesting point here because here's this what appears to be this negativity and you're interpreting it or the, here comes this 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 thing and you're interpreting it as negativity and so on and the thing that we should do is to thank that negativity this goes to what ed was saying and that we should thank that negativity because we are the one who's having the reaction. We are the one who is developing the karma with this. It's our bad reaction. So what we should do is turn that around by transforming it and send them loving kindness and compassion like Bhavani said. Regardless of what their intention was, we have no way of really knowing that. Our intention, I mean, but our, but our karma is one that is either going to be positive or negative, and we need to neutralize it in a big hurry. 
So by saying, okay, I'm going to show love and compassion to that negativity or to that confusion that is within myself and not make it greater by, by disparaging that person, then we diffuse the situation. Yeah, not, I saw, not allow it to get worse. I saw a saying online very much of what you just said, Lance, which it said is what, what people do is their karma, but how you react to it is your karma. That's right. Just, and what you can't change other people's karma. Right. You can only, only can... change your karma. Yeah. And, and, and all this is appearances. So yeah. we are interpreting all these things with our emotions. So at the core of this, that's what Zara was saying, that she became very emotional over this. And she couldn't get over her emotion. But that's really great to see. That in itself and is... You thank, you, you thank the situation. Now I can see my emotion. Yeah. Excellent. So as we would say, it's a teachable moment. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Lance, for sharing time to talk through that out loud, because I feel like those are the things that, um, that I don't know, are difficult for other people on this call, but, like, I think that provide every day, like, natural opportunities every single day to recognize that that may be happening and to shift focus. So I love that you just talked out loud with us about that. Well, that's good. No, that's, that's, that's what this is all about, to be able to do that. And Adrian, how are you? Are you back from your vacation, or are you still down in Costa Rica? Oh, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm a little sore. A little sore? Yeah, I'm not on vacation here. I'm, uh, I came here to do uh, dental surgery. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I had no idea. Oh. I just did that today. I'm enjoying the sights. It's beautiful here, but uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I thought the only reason to go to Costa Rica was to lay on the beach, eat bananas, and lay in the sun. <laughs> well, you can do that. You can do that. You can go to the beach after you're done with your dental, uh, whatever. But I chose to do a Dharma class. I so, see. Thank you all. All right. And I was going to say to all that, the Tibetans always say, I think, I was just reading this in the glimpse after glimpse today because I had all this time to read, but they're saying that the positive side to each non-virtuous action is that it can always be purified. That's right. I like that. So yeah. it's a true reflection of your practice and it shows you where you need to put your practice in. Okay, very good. Well, I hope you have a, a speedy recovery. Yes, sir. I'm sure you will. I'm already up. All right, good. Does anybody else have anything you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, yeah, Lance. Uh, go ahead. I've always tried to um, remember that um, you, when, when you say something negative to me, I turn it around and go positive to you. And I, I try not to take anything that anybody says to me to heart because they're in a, they're in a space that, that is, is not uh, conducive to my health. But if I'm, if, if I don't react to it, to their actions, then that that stops everything right there. And being able to uh, uh, yeah, being able to uh, uh, not take it to heart, uh, and and uh, that keeps down my anger. Sure. And, and uh, I, I find that that's, that's a, a, a real good, real good thing. It keeps you from throwing hammers across the room. Yeah. 
Well, it's good, you know, that you can do that, you know. Um, maybe we all try and do that ourselves, but sometimes it's the one that we're not really uh, paying attention to that gets us, you know, and then we throw the hammer. So we have to be on guard. But you're you're right, and that's and that's what I was saying. That's what the protection is. The Dharma becomes your protection. The Dharma becomes your you rely on the Dharma to help you through the situation, to be able to analyze the situation, recognize the situation, find the antidote of the situation, and then to protect yourself against future situation. You know, so that's what. That's what uh, the protection, the purification is all about. So if we can, if that becomes an automatic thing for us, you know, where we, we our, our protection is always working for us, that's a really good attainment. That's a great city, you know, as we would say. Okay. So anybody else have anything? Because I, I want to get, I just want to finish up this chapter and then I want to do just another short meditation together with everybody to give everybody another practice session. So here it says in the chapter, the last part of the chapter, it says, we generally start with tightness in meditation. When we start as beginners, you know, we're thinking about the structure, we're thinking about all this rigidity, am I doing these things right and everything. So it's natural for us to, to have a tight, rigid attitude towards this. It may be a little bit relaxed, but that's our goal is to make it relaxed. So our attitude of being very careful and determined to meditate and wanting to have a, sec, a, a successful meditation. So we may be tight, but our goal is to have a, a, a successful meditation. So then- How do you, before, What, what is a successful meditation? I'm a, I'm a process analyst. Uh, what's the measure of success? Like, how do you know it was successful? Peace of mind. Okay, fair. Thank you. So we first need to be diligent about our posture. It's an important part of the process. It gives us a structure it's there for a purpose. We've gone over it a couple times now. We're going to do it again in a minute. And it has a purpose to it. And this is stuff that is thousands of years old. You know, it's not some new agey thing that somebody thought of, you know, in a pipe dream. It is, you know, this is tried and true stuff that comes from the East more than the West. And it's a great blessing that they, the Eastern people, have been practicing the technology of the mind for millennia. The Western people have been, you know, practicing the, the technology of physics and the intellect, you know, and, and they both have value. But now we live in a time where these two things are coming together. And if we don't seize both of the, the, the virtuous potential of this, what fools we are. So there's a, there's a system in place on both sides. And what we're seeing is that we are morphing into what may now be a new system. That is a, that is a, a, a conglomerate or, or whatever, an aggregate or a, a, a coalescence of these two things. If we were to come back in 500 years, it, it, we may see this evolution of morphing coming together. It's only been, you know, a couple of generations. It's only been 50, 60 years that the Eastern philosophy like this has come to the West. It hasn't been a very long time. 
So we need to be diligent with our posture. Then we apply ourselves with effort in the meditation and are careful not to fall under the influence of distraction and not to follow after thoughts concerning the past, present, and future. So we have to create some, um, some rules for ourselves that are, you know, to have a good space, a comfortable space, uh, uh, where we're not going to be interrupted by phone calls and people making noises and, and things like that, that we can have a space for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or a half an hour, whatever it is, where we can just practice this calm abiding meditation. So we're controlling this as best as we can. And that we're, we're trying to keep our thoughts, one-pointed mindfulness thoughts, and we're not allowing them to, to drift too far. And if they do, we can bring them back. We know how to bring them back one-pointedly to our reference point, to our object of, of meditation. And then the next is we are determined that when we sit down, we will not let conceptual thoughts arise that we will just meditate. So that's our goal. If we can do that, thoughts will come up that are going to interrupt us. And we have to use the techniques that we've talked about to help us to compartmentalize those. If they won't compartmentalize, then we have to spend our meditation thinking about those things. But if we can compartmentalize, then there is a victory there because now we can see that there is this space and time that is meditation, that is peace of mind, and that has value and that we can repeat that over and over again. And that is success. Lance, can you please repeat one more time? Uh, what you said at the beginning, like not to, excuse me. That we start, in, we start with tightness in meditation. Um, no, I was referring to uh, not to let thoughts arise. Is that right? Not to let conceptual thoughts arise. Conceptual thoughts arise. So, and, uh, and if they do, that we know how to, we know how to uh, compartmentalize them. Conceptual thoughts will come up but we shouldn't chase after them and we shouldn't invite them in. You know, we shouldn't be trying to bring them in. Say, this is my meditation. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be thinking, I'm gonna, that my meditation is a contemplation. There's a difference between contemplation and meditation. Meditation comes after contemplation. When we exhaust an intellectual contemplation then meditation comes by itself that's what Lance, could, you, Lance, could you give a practical example of what you mean well let's say the whole question about the emotions and that the emotions have causes so and then so we 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 pick it apart say, oh, I'm having this emotion. What's the cause of this emotion? You know, where did it come from? And so on. Look again, how it's affecting me. What didn't I do properly that I'm still so emotional about this? What should I have done? And then till you get to the point where you say, okay, I can't change that because it's already happened but I can stop being emotional about it. There's nothing I can do about it. And I'm going to do everything I can not to have this rise up again or to have my reaction to this circumstance rise up and become emotional again. And then you let it go. And that's exhausting all those possibilities. You've looked at all the causes. You looked at all the actions. You looked at all the possible results. You've come to the conclusion that I'm not going to do it anymore. I forgive myself. Now it's just time to rest. And then the meditation comes. 
It's just the relaxation of the mind. Lance, I do, I do have a question for him okay. related to this. Are the conceptual thoughts, do they have the same nature with Rigpa? No. Meditation? Rigpa is the meditation. Rigpa is a word that is indicative of that meditative mind. So they have different nature. It has the nature of meditation. It has the nature of of space. It has the nature of of Mahamudra, of Zogchen. All those words that we are that are in our vernacular that we use to connote that spacious mind, that the, the mind of the Buddha. And now you're talking about meditation, right? What's that? And now you're talking about meditation. That, yeah, that... Rigpa is a meditation. Is right. Is, is the is the, the the mind of meditation? But can be conceptual thoughts considered as having the same intrinsic nature as Rigpa? Conceptual thoughts are conceptual. By nature, they are they are phenomenal. They're relative. But they're empty. They're empty. They are. They are. Um, they're right. Empty of their own intrinsic value. Exactly. Rigpa just is. Rigpa is just be here now. And so I'm just going down the rabbit hole a little bit with this. But being here now, sometimes can be conceptual thoughts as well. And well, as that's, long, that's up to you. As long as but, but it's not Rigpa. But it can be. Those but thoughts can, can come in and go. Right. So your thoughts can come in and go. And it's up to you to to interrupt your Rigpa. But it's not necessarily an interruption if you see them as having the same nature. Because everything is emptiness, considering conceptual intellectual thought. Well, if it's peace of if it's peace of mind, right. it all depends on the way that you you want to define it. If you want to clutter it up with the idea that conceptual thoughts are as important as Rigpa, that's up to you. No, I'm not necessarily saying that that they're as important as that. I'm just bringing the idea that conceptual thoughts can be brought into meditative state of mind. Why? Regarded as empty. Why? Because that's, I think, our goal. Well, right? It's not Rigpa. It's not Rigpa until you let those thoughts go. Exactly. That's that's what I'm saying. Okay. Well then, then okay. Well then, say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> They're not. They don't happen concurrently. You know, if your point is that they happen in the field of rigpa. Yes. That they happen in the field of rigpa. Then. There is a point there. That's yeah, that's what but I mean. There, but there is no attachment. Right. There is no aversion to those thoughts. Right. You know, and it requires um, an enlightened one, the awareness of the enlightened one to be able to, to manage that. And therefore, they will be in the you know meditation. So it's in a space. It's in a space that is beyond most all of us. Right. And for myself, I haven't been very successful at that. 
Yeah, because we and have what's a more and what's more, I don't want to be particularly successful at that. Yeah. There's no need for that. Because that's 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 saying to me that that the phenomenal world is is at least as important as as the absolute as the absolute reality, as the absolute truth. I see and that's what, and that's what, and that's what people deal with is trying to find one truth that satisfies both of those propositions. But why can't there be two truths? Definitely. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. There are two truths. I think what I'm saying is definitely for more like advanced meditation level, probably somebody who um, is in that state of mind the whole time, every, every day, every night. <laughs> no, and there's no conceptual thoughts. Right, they're basically a Buddha. Yeah. So, so there, you know, that's the example that, that, you know, if there's conceptual thought, now you've been brought back into the phenomenal. You're no longer a Buddha at that point. Right. Well, isn't uh, so? Isn't conceptual thought either concurrent with or uh, or a a result of uh, of attachment and aversion? Yes. Mm. Our natural state is peace of mind. Non-conceptuality, nothing to express. Does that mean conceptionality is a bad thing? It's a relative thing. It's a departure from our natural state. It is our natural state. It is our, it is our phenomenal natural state. <laughs> The gradual, it's a gradual path. That's what puts us on first. We need to conceptualize. Yeah, let me uh, with that. We're going to get to a point in this book, uh, a couple chapters, where we're going to talk about what we call the two truths. Okay. So we'll explore this whole idea, you know, of what this what this means to us, as we are looking at it as human beings. I will eagerly anticipate that. Thank you. Yes. OK, so now's a good time to everybody sit. Get on your sit bones. Keep your back straight. Your hands together four inches below your navel or at your knees, whatever's comfortable for you, your shoulders back, your head, your neck just a little bit forward, your chin just a little bit down, your eyes open or closed. Your tongue on the roof of your mouth behind your front teeth. Breathing through both nostrils. If you have difficulty breathing through your nose, use your mouth. That's fine, but it's better if you can breathe through both nostrils and exhale through both nostrils. We're, we're breathing very serenely. So we breathe in through both nostrils. We fill both lungs with fresh, clean, pure air by expanding the, the belly, our abdomen, which pulls down the diaphragm, which opens up the lungs and it sucks that pure, clean, fresh air in, positive air coming in. And we hold that breath. And 
Exhale. Squeeze the abdomen, pushes against the diaphragm, pushes against the lungs, pushes all that stale, negative, dark air out, and we hold that vacant breath. Keep your body straight. Keep your body relaxed. Breathe in both nostrils. Expand the diaphragm, the belly. Hold the breath. Exhale. Squeeze it all out. Hold that empty breath. Breathe in fresh, clean, pure, white air, clear air. Exhale, start dark, negative, stale air. Breathe in. Hold it. Exhale. Five. Breathe in. Breathe in. Exhale. Seven. Keep your body relaxed. Breathe in. Exhale. In. Out. Nine. Breathe in. Out. Ten. In. Out. Eleven. In. Out.
12. Then. Thirteen. Ten. Out. Fourteen. In. Out. Fifteen. In. Sixteen. In. Let your body relax. No tension. Out. Seventeen. Out. Eighteen. In. Nineteen. In. Out. Twenty. Breathe in very deeply. Exhale quite completely. Relax, keep your eyes closed, keep your stare, your gaze. Breathe normally at your own speed. And just continue watching the breath. Fresh, clean, pure, white, the clear air coming in. Stale, negative, dark air 
going out. Stay relaxed. Watch the breath. wanders, just bring it back, watching the breath. your back straight, take a deep breath, hold it, exhale, open your eyes, okay. So the bottom line to this is there should be a strong commitment, an attitude of commitment. I want to meditate.
Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay, then Michael, will you do the dedication, please? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> page 18 and go through the uh, dedication prayer by Jigna Simkin. The Lineage Dedication Prayer. Dorje Chang, Talopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Dharma Lord Digampopa, Pagmodrupa, and Lord Drinkumpa, please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessings of all the Kagyu Lamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all-knowing state, and may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn, may it arise, but ever, where, where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri, the warrior, realized the ultimate state, and as did Samantabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all the merit for all sentient beings. By the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. By the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate root of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Drinkumpa Ratna Sri, who is omniscient Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Dedication prayer by Lord Jigtan Sumgo. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, divine assembly of yidams and assemblies of Buddhas, bodhisattvas, yogins, yoginis, and dakinis dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate root of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a Shravaka or Pratika Buddha. May all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Maras and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise even for a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta, and through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily 
in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I, in any case, gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Om, ah, home. Om, ah, home. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable from the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Hey, Lance. Hey, everybody. I I found this in the glimpse after glimpse. So go Rinpoche. Yes. Um, and I think it pertains to what we were discussing about today. I don't know if uh, anybody's interested in hearing about this. Sure. What page is it? What day? It, uh, what, what, what's the it's day? July 20th. All right. Let me see. I can read this if anybody's interested in spending one more minute. All right, go ahead. Imagine that you had gone all your life without ever washing, and then one day you decide to take a shower. You start scrubbing away, but then watch in horror as the dirt begins to ooze out of the pores of your skin and stream down your body. Something must be wrong. You were supposed to be getting cleaner and all you can see is grime. You panic and fling yourself out of the shower, convinced that you should never have begun. But you only end up even more dirty than before. You have no way of knowing that the wisest thing to do is to be patient and to finish the shower. It may look for a while as if you're getting even dirtier, but if you keep wa washing, you will emerge fresh and clean. It's all a process the process of purification. Whenever doubt arises, see it as simply as an obstacle. Recognize it as an understanding that is calling out to be clarified or unblocked. And know that it is not a fundamental problem, but simply a stage in the process of purification and learning. Allow the process to continue and complete itself and never lose your trust or resolve. This is the way followed by all the great practitioners of the past who used to say, there's no armor like perseverance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was helpful. Good night, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you all very much. Next week, we'll be talking about karma, cause, and effect. So strap in. <laughs> <laughs>